Although Pathé had been selling films and equipment in France for some 20 years, it was not until September 1929 that the Pathéscope Monthly was published and distributed by the British end of the company. 9.5mm was the premier film gauge, and with the projectors, cameras and film being eagerly embraced by a public and trance by the prospect of moving images in their own homes, sales to the, albeit better off, sword. The films, all silent, ranged in those early days from cowboy and comedy shorts to full-length features. Stars of those days like the British actress Betty Balfour featured on the covers. Inside, the magazine was packed with information about getting the most from the hobby. Not too many people these days would fancy taking a lens apart, still less putting it back. The best loved and efficient camera in 1932 was the Pathé Lux motor camera. Some of the projectors left a lot to be desired, being hand cranked with a low light output. But this was remedied later with better lamps and bolt on motors. Today's children are probably under the impression that their video productions are a modern innovation. Well, they are in video, but the children of 1932 were making films also. More films were released, some with intriguing titles. To do justice to the increasing demand for more light on the screen and steadier pictures, the 200B projector was introduced at £15, a seemingly modest sum, until the website Measuringworth revealed that using the average earnings comparator, the cost today is a staggering £2,900. The film, of course, had to be physically joined unlike today's video. Little did the author of this article know of what 1945 held, but Pathoscope did not forget this request. An article in 1949 printed the replies, and quite intriguing they are. See them later. Because the films were silent, and many of them were of German or French origin, where the visuals told the story, helped along by subtitles, Everyone could read them. From drama and horror to Mickey Mouse, to which Pathoscope had recently acquired the rights. 
This is one of the very early 30 feet films. Show this on the cheaper hand cranked ace projector with a film in a cartridge instead of a reel. Or you could be more ambitious and have your own cinema in the shed and invite the neighbours to see the latest newsreels, shorts, and features equipped with the latest from the ever growing range of projectors. In 1936, King George V died, and following the brief reign of Edward, King George VI and Queen Elizabeth were crowned, an event well covered by Pothosco. Lingerie department might have helped this lady. No Nintendo or video games in those days. Now, 9.5mm boasted a soundtrack which brought about an enormous increase in the range of films available. One could hear Gracie Fields at full throttle. The machine which made this revolution possible was the Puthy Vox, a machine that weighed a ton, or so it seemed, and cost 67 pounds. In 1937, Puthy brought Popeye to the market. Thank <laughs> you. 
This is how he started and progressed downhill to Opportunity Knox. That was in 1938 when also a mind-numbing educational film just begged to be bought. However, the excellent Pothoscope gazettes were also issued full of entertainment value. same issue were photographs of the Hindenburg horror fire. But, just as the Pothy were really hitting the jackpot with the new box office smash hits of George Formby and Gracie Fields, in 1939, the ominous rumblings from Europe transformed in September into the explosion of the Second World War. The state of war once more exists between Great Britain and Germany. For it is evil thing, injustice, oppression, only 25 minutes after war had been declared came the first air raid warning. For obvious reasons, we have cut out the sound of the sirens. Production of the Pathoscope Monthly abruptly ceased, and it wasn't until June 1940 that a two-page economy version was printed. It showed that films were still being printed, all British and American. France no longer accessible, but Gone were the helpful hints and club news. Some of the films were of the documentary and newsreel type, which must have been very well received by a news-hungry audience. These spasmodically issued monthlies were by now single sheets, again announcing new films, but following government restrictions on newsprint, publication stopped completely with the October 1941 issue and would not be seen again until November 1949, four years after the end of the war. On May 7th, 1945, there came at last an end to the war, which for almost six harsh years had conditioned the lives and the aims of the British people. Released from wartime pressures, which had become almost intolerable, the British joined in a war. In November 1949, the monthly came back in all its former pre-war glory, with a new sound feature on the cover. Remember the article asking for a prediction of home movies in 1945? Well, the editor hadn't forgotten. Some of the predictions were uncannily accurate, others wide of the mark. More film releases, including the highly popular Betty Boop cartoons. The launch of the futuristic looking silent projector. The gem, with a more powerful lump. The old days though, were still there, but now with a motor.
big step forward in sound projectors was the marketing of the stylish looking packs. The Weibo camera with more features than the motor camera also came on the scene. With all this new equipment, advice on filming came with every issue. for the dedicated and well-heeled amateur and quite a few professionals, particularly in France, Pathé released the Weibo Ebn, packed with features and for those who could not afford the packs and wished to show the many sound films, a gem was bolted onto a combined amplifier and sound head and called the Sun. Quite a number of silent films yet, but the lure of James Mason and the like must have tempted many to switch to the talkies. Many a silent movie was made, however, and with titling and editing could prove very satisfactory, if only to the baker. This excerpt is from a film I made when I was 20. The huge Pathoscope factory by this time was processing some 9,000 films a week. Because sound projectors were costly, the huge numbers of people with silent machines needed some sound, and this was provided by gramophone records, so Pathy kindly published an article showing how to cue the music tracks to the film. Competitions, new films, new equipment, all were announced in 1952, but the one dominant event was the coronation of Queen Elizabeth. Even the route and advantageous filming sites had a mention. The very professional looking Pathy Weibo M was featured in a 1952 issue. Such was the interest of professionals in 9.5mm that even the legendary and highly regarded Paylard Bolex produced this beautiful camera. By now, Pathyscope had an impressive catalogue of equipment and was cashing in on the plethora of films issued following the coronation. All, however, was not well. Increasing competition from the cheaper Kodak Standard 8 colour film and lightweight equipment forced Pathoscope in 1955 to include 8mm and 16mm into a now renamed Pathoscope Gazette. 
Future gazing by pathoscope seemed not to include the Kodak threat. It could be said that the management were falling asleep on the job. The outcome was falling sales, exacerbated by the marketing of some poorly designed cameras and projectors. The final gazette was published in April 1959, followed by the company going into receivership in February 1960. The end of an era. Captured within the pages of the Pathisco monthlies since 1929 was a microcosm of three momentous decades for the world and for the amateur cine movement. Never on the outside, always in the middle.